Hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, depending where you are joining us at the moment. My name is Rodrigo Olivares Caminal, and I'm a professor in banking and finance law at Queen Mary University of London. I'm delighted to welcome you today to this conference on SPACs, Special Purpose Acquisition Companies, that will take place over the next two days. We selected, then rather than running it in a single block, to do it over two days during what is now considered the prime time of the internet, which is lunchtime in Europe. So that allows us to cover Asia and the Americas as well. So that's why we decided that it would be more convenient to split the day over the, the conference over two days, today and tomorrow. And we have a, a stellar lineup of speakers. I am here to just do a quick introduction, a quick welcome, and then uh, we will just kick start with the event. I'm also the director of the Institute for Global Law, Economics and Finance, which is the main organizer of today's event, of course, uh, done uh, at, the, at Queen Mary University of London, where the Institute sits. And today's event is organized in association with uh, Bocconi University and EDEC Business School. And this event has been uh, sponsored by Elenov Grossman and Scholl LLP, the law firm in New York, which is one of the eminent law firms in the SPAC spectrum. So uh, without further ado, I will give the floor to Douglas Elenov, who will be giving us a very short introduction. Good morning. My name is Doug Elenoff. I am a partner in the New York-based law firm of Elenoff, Grossman and Scholl. We're one of the leading law firms in the world having to do with the SPAC program. Uh, I hope you enjoy the Queen Mary University of London two-day conference on the topic of are SPACs the new IPO? Um, my law firm has been involved in the SPAC program for nearly 20 years. We've been involved in nearly 400 SPAC IPOs and 150 business combinations. Uh, we just had our annual SPAC conference here in the United States two weeks ago. There's a lot going on uh, and there has been a lot going on as a result of the pandemic and certain high profile SPACs and DSPACs, one of which was Virgin Galactic. And we obviously all got to see Richard Branson uh, or, uh, go to outer space yesterday and float. And that was exciting. And I'd like to think that the SPAC market had something to do with it. And it's not just Virgin Galactic. <laughs> it's nearly 150 other private companies that have found their footing in the public markets and have been able to raise significant capital by way of transacting with SPACs. In the US, we have another 450 SPAC I, uh, companies that have, these, uh, have done their IPOs and are looking for targets. I'm pleased that uh, the UK capital markets and uh, securities authorities have revisited the conversation about how to modernize SPACs uh, and make them more useful in, in England as well as in the EU. Obviously, some of your speakers will be coming to you from Italy, where they've had a successful SPAC program, been involved with many SPACs and DSPACs and created public companies. Uh, as it relates to whether or not the SPAC is a new form of IPO, uh, you will debate that over the next couple of days. From my point of view, uh, the traditional IPO has tremendous merit for certain uh, blue chip uh, unicorn companies that can attract underwriters, research analysts, and many retail investors. But there are many more private companies that deserve to go public. And even though the consolidation in the investment banking community has made that a more difficult pathway to the public markets, the SPAC has proven itself out over 25 years in the United States and 
nearly uh, 10, 15 years in the UK, uh, that there are plenty of other private companies that may elect to go public and want to do it in, uh, in a way to help them raise money and tap the capital markets and become responsible members of the public community to pursue their journey. And in the United States in the last 18 months, as I'm sure you'll hear today, nearly 600 companies have gone public and, uh, and 150 private companies are now public due to the SPAC mechanism and the attractive features that a SPAC has versus a traditional IPO. Uh, in addition to the SPAC, you also have direct listings in the United States, which is another means by which going public. So I, I while I happen to be a SPAC lawyer, we also do a, a number of traditional IPOs and we are in favor of modernization of securities laws like with direct listings. So it's not a competition between the three, it's merely just options available for the private companies to pursue whichever means of going public that they elect. Uh, the SPAC just happens to have gained a lot of media attention, media attention in the last year and a half. And I am sure you're gonna have a very robust conversation over the next couple of days about the pros and the cons. Uh, as it relates to the regulatory environment in the United States, uh, it is, uh, there's a lot, been a lot of press written about it. The SEC's put out a lot of releases about it. It is certainly their jurisdiction to make sure that all markets operate efficiently. And consequently, given the volumes, they've felt the need to uh, put out releases as it relates to how the industry ought to conduct its affairs. I think net-net, you will find that we have created a tremendous number of additional public companies, created shareholder wealth, and raise capital for companies that are meritorious. Uh, I fully expect the same to be true in England with their modernized approach to the SPAC business, which will take on its unique uh, form in, in England and then elsewhere, whether it's in Italy, Hong Kong, or elsewhere in the world. I am available to speak to anybody about the SPAC industry and the features that we have found to be helpful in the United States. I apologize that I can't be with you with you there today uh, due to a, a conflict that I have, uh, a wedding in the family. And uh, it's, it's uh, unfortunate for me because I would have liked to have met you all. So I hope you have two days of productive conversation, robust debate. Again, thank you to Queen Mary University of London for being involved with this back program. And I look forward to hearing from you all. Have a great two days. Bye. Okay, thank you uh, very much. Those were some uh, opening and thank you remarks by Doug Elanoff, who has kindly sponsored, uh, his law firm has kindly sponsored this event. So what I'm going to do now is before we go to the, to the main attraction, which are our guest speakers, I'm going to do a kind of a very quick a framing presentation uh, as uh, an opening remarks, but I would like to strongly invite you to participate uh, through the chat box, uh, putting forward your questions. I'll be collating questions. And the idea is I will try to, the, today's conference or today's uh, segment of the conference will have two parts. The first one where we have our three distinguished speakers. Dr. Daniele Dalbia, uh, who is the organizer. Dr. Daniele Dalbia is a teaching fellow at uh, Queen Mary University of London. And he, he is a pioneer on SPARCs. He did his PhD on SPARCs uh, several years ago, prior to this uh, craze that we're experiencing at the moment. And he has been publishing some of the leading papers papers on the topic, including one who was awarded a, a distinction prize in the US. And we also have today uh, Carlos Lobo. He's a partner at Hughes Hubbard, Hubbard Reed in, in the US. And he will be discussing some of the legal implications of SPACs. And we also have Milos Vulanovic from EDEC Business School, one of the 
institution who is uh, running this event in association with us. And he will be looking more at the economic dynamics of SPACs. So, but I would like to once more strongly encourage you to actively participate in the conversation as I will be collating uh, the questions. And then uh, in the second part of the event, after the presentation of our distinguished speakers, we are going to have an open conversation, a dialogue. It would be, I would like to make it very dynamic, like a ping pong back and forth, uh, not taking everything for granted, not taking some uh, numbers as a month or general wisdom, but we will have a conversation to see if we can ignite the debate and, and, and see whether we can answer the question as to whether SPACs are the new IPOs. So what I'm going to do now, I'm going to share my screen and you should be looking at my screen now. And basically, uh, I'm going to try to give you in in not more than five to seven minutes uh, my take on what Daniele has posed as uh, the main topic of today's conversation as to whether our SPACs the new IPOs. And uh, this clearly uh, Douglas Elenov has already advanced uh, his view to one with which I share to a great extent. But basically, if we look at uh, what has been happening in, in, in this segment in, in the market of SPACs, what we, what we know is that they've been representing a, a big segment uh, and they are probably 50.3 of, of the total US IPO. This is data for 2020. And basically the fact that they have surpassed the 50% mark, that already tells you a lot about the market. Basically deal size average above 300 million. Uh, last year there were 83 billion in capital raise and there were a total of 248 SPACs in 2020. So basically, if you look at this, for me, the first bubble is the one which is the more important one is that they are, nowadays they represent 50% uh, of total US IPO. So this is what it's telling you. It's uh, one, there's a great demand and there's a, and a great search. But for those of you that uh, come purely from the M&A sector or from the capital markets, you you come across this new vehicle, which is, uh, um, in my view, and in its simplistic form, is financial innovation. It's uh, uh, if you if you want, you can call it, and we will have probably this discussion afterwards in the round table. It's a, a simplified IPO, or you can call it it's a shortcut to an IPO. But also, I think that it provides some additional degrees of flexibility. And, and I know that I'm being a little bit provocative with, with my, my remarks, but I would like to have this conversation when the time comes. But basically, SPAC stands for Special Purpose Acquisition Companies and are public listed companies. They were originally referred as blank check companies because you have money parked in a company to do an acquisition of what or whatever it is decided at a later stage. They issue units composed of ordinary shares and warrants. And then the proceeds are held in trust uh, in an escrow account. The, the SPAC will be managed by a, a sponsor team. And basically the acquisition should take place usually within a period of 24 months. And that's called the de that, that That's when you undo the SPAC. And then the SPAC vehicle will be merged with the target and ends up on the target. If it's a non-listed company, it will end up being listed. So basically what I have explained here on, on the diagram, you have it uh, on the left uh, as, sorry, as, as the structure. And then the, the million dollar question is whether we should regulate SPACs or whether SPACs should be self-regulated and, and that's in a nutshell the the million dollar question basically whether we should increase the degree of regulation on, on these new companies it all started uh, uh, listed on the penny stock market in the 1970s 
they were cash shell companies and they were known the, as pump and dump schemes. So basically some of the bad press that you are seeing currently on, on SPACs, it's not new, it's kind of, it comes with in the DNA of these vehicles. And the question is whether there's a real need for greater financial regulation of these vehicles. And then, then we can see in 1990s, the chairman of GKN Securities, uh, David Nussbaum, had become known as the godfather of SPACs. And back then he voluntarily complied with rule 419 to attract interest of investors. That was uh, putting the, the funds on escrow. And that's when uh, the so-called blank check companies were redefined as SPACs and they started issuing uh, units. And then uh, pressing fast forward, we moved back to, we moved to 2003, 2004, when there was a pickup in the emergence of SPACs. And that's when, when two major developments took place. One is a redemption that you can redeem your share, even if you voted no to a proposed business combination. And also green mailing where in, an investor or a group of investors could green mail the deal. And that takes us very quickly to 2003, when we have, sorry, 2015, where we have SPAC 3.0 basically where you can decouple the right to vote and to redeem your shares. And basically the whole idea there is to be able to still benefit from the possibility of a, having voted no, but still benefit from a potential upside from your warrants. And what, what, where we are kind of now is uh, there's no strict financial regulation on, on, on these SPAC vehicles. There's no strict supervision by the regulator or the actual exchange. And at the moment, uh, we are living in a world of self-regulation and indirect soft law approach. And uh, we are starting to see a, a slight swift where there's a greater appetite for a proper uh, financial regulation and also we are seeing like for the example of Malaysia direct soft law approach on on these vehicles and just to to wrap this up and give the floor to our speakers I think that 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 the secret here is finding the right balance and and for me in order to fight the right balance I think that the the main issue are the four bubbles that they have at the bottom uh, sitting on top of an arrow that is kind of pointing the way forward, right? And I think that basically the first thing is one that we all need to know, which is we need to be able to differentiate between retail and sophisticated investors uh, in the sense that uh, we there's no need to, to regulate if there's no uh, actual risk or if the risk is a measure risk or a risk that sophisticated investors one understand two price and three can eventually hedge the second one is do not over regulate clearly the market is telling us that there's a huge appetite for these vehicles i think uh, that a uh, if we over regulate we will be end up asphyxiating a uh, this particular segment uh, and we have seen some of the the consequences that we have seen in the aftermath of the the big crash recently and uh, the, and i think that that we need to be conscious that this is just another financial innovation that what is doing is it is providing a solution that the market currently needs and a solution that the market currently wants. Of course, uh, I'm not saying uh, let SPACs do whatever they want, but basically that's why uh, we need to try to protect, and, but we need to make sure what are we trying to protect and not in the process get confused and end up over-regulating and as a consequence over-killing the market. And this is clearly signal but by the fact that the market prefers clarity and i know that one of the speakers will be talking about this later on that 
some of the SPACs that have been performing better are those that have been a industry focus or segment focus or business. That clearly tells us that the market itself ends up uh, providing or, or granting a premium to those that are kind of more circumscribed in what they can and cannot do. And, and, and this is a market reaction that is resulting in, I will not say self-regulation because this is not regulation per se, but this is self-constraint -con of the vehicles to achieve the desired outcome of both the market and the sponsors. And then uh, finally, uh, kind of in agreement with Douglas Elenov is the issue that uh, SPACs are different than uh, IPOs. And by that, what I mean is that um, I think that that they are targeting a, a different segment of the market. They are not targeting the, the blue chip, the big big marquee names, the, the one that basically also uh, Douglas refers as uh, the newcomers and the unicorns, but these are another segment of the market that uh, otherwise would not be able to go public. And these are uh, the ones that require greater flexibility and, and, and less burden. We have seen this in other areas of the law that there are kind of special regimes for small, medium enterprises. And, and this can perfectly be the case. I'm not, I'm not implying that basically all of the, the SPACs are small, medium enterprises, but this, this could be a parallelism that can be drawn uh, going forward. And, and what I think is very important is distinguishing that they are targeting a different segment of the market. And, and I will stop there uh, and, and I will uh, briefly uh, hand over to Daniele as the organizer in case he wants to, to say something very quickly or if not otherwise uh, for him to hand over to, to the first speaker. Daniele? The floor is thanks. yours. Thanks, Diego. thanks for the introduction and presentation and welcome everyone to this conference on SPACs that actually, I mean, uh, as uh, also Rodrigo was mentioning, are uh, an alternative investment form for uh, private equity and for uh, acquisition models. And I think I will uh, give uh, the floor to the first speaker of today, who is uh, Carlos Lobo. Thank you, Daniel, to Rodrigo. Thank you for the invitation uh, to be here. It's, it's a pleasure uh, to be participating in such prestigious event with such uh, uh, distinguished panelists. Um, I think that uh, the presentation that uh, uh, or the introduction that uh, Rodrigo uh, made was very helpful because it gives you an overview of how the transaction of a SPAC is structured, what are the main steps, and so uh, the, the purpose of, of my presentation will be focused more on, on key transactional uh, aspects of the, of the deals. Um, I think that the, the IPO portion, as, as Rodrigo has this described it, uh, it's, it resembles very much uh, an IPO. Uh, it, it doesn't uh, differentiate mine. It's, it's essentially, a company making a public offering in the capital markets. Of course, the, the major difference, of course, is that it's a company without any assets or business. So it's it's a pure uh, uh, shell and, and the disclosure involved essentially the expertise, experience of, of the sponsors, right? And, and key features that are different, you may question in, uh, in the sponsor promote uh, uh, and some uh, the trust. So those are the main uh, difference. But other than that, it's a traditional IPO. So uh, what I would focus my my uh, talk here, it's more on the demerger, uh, the DSPAC process, the merger of the SPAC with uh, with a target, which I think it, that's the, the the big difference where we see in the market. That's a more complex part of the that uh, steps. And where I, there is much more transactional aspects involved, actual negotiations going on between the different parties. Um, when 
through the, the step by step that uh, Professor Rodrigo has described it, after the, the spec has gone public, uh, it has a, a time frame to, to search for, for a target for a company to combine with, which usually is around 18 to 24 months. When, when the, the SPAC finds a, a potential uh, target for the combination, then they engage in, in negotiations of the key transactional terms. Uh, and I think that's, that's where the more uh, interesting and different features that we find in transactions like these. Uh, of course, uh, but it, it does also uh, 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 guard some resemblance with the transition uh, merger or combination, since it's essentially an MA transaction of a private uh, with a public company. Uh, the key, uh, uh, of course, issues involve first fixing the enterprise value. Well, I think this is one of the, the great advantages. I think we'll be talking a bit further about that. What are the advantages and advantages, it's the advantage of each model. But I think that being able to fix the enterprise value early on in the process, as opposed to an IPO where you have that by the end, it's one of the key advantages, right? And, and, and that's uh, heavily negotiated. Uh, and especially sometimes there are competitive process where uh, uh, targets have more than one spec uh, uh, interested in merging with them. Uh, and the enterprise value is uh, uh, decisive in choosing which one to, to, to combine with. Um, sometimes, and, and, and that has been some discussion about that. I think uh, Professor Rodrigo mentioned about the involvement of the market. Uh, that's not regulation, but uh, the, what's interesting that vehicles, it's very dynamic and, and it reacts. The sponsors, uh, one after the other, are improving the structure and the features of those vehicles to respond to some critics of, of the market. And one of them involves the enterprise value. So. Sometimes people say that can be inflated. Uh, uh, I say that the one, there are ways of protecting it. We are seeing sometimes transactions with some downside protection for the pipe investors, for example, where you can bring in features where the pipe investors will receive additional shares depending on how the stocks perform after the combination. So this is something that will be negotiated with the pipe investors. Uh, there are some cases, of course, of price adjustment. You can, depending on, on the time frame between the sign-in and closing, you can uh, adjust price by uh, net debt or other, other types of uh, uh, economic features. But also, it's common to, to, on the other hand, try to restrict the ability of the company to raise that in between sign-in and closing and have no price adjustments at all to make it more predictable for the target shareholders. Um, in terms of structure, uh, you tend to see two different variations. Of course, you can structure in many different ways. It's a very flexible vehicle, but you tend to see either a traditional uh, uh, reverse merger uh, in the US where you have the SPAC forming uh, a subsidiary and the target company would essentially merge uh, with the subsidiary of the SPAC with its shareholders then migrating to the, to the SPAC, uh, receiving a public traded stock. But uh, as the SPAC uh, world kind of uh, uh, expand and, and start to do more uh, uh, offshore deals, uh, uh, acquire companies outside of the US, we are starting to see variations in the structure. And one of the most uh, used ones for, for that reason is to form a new entity actually, uh, which then will be listed. And, and that entity then have two subsidiaries that are used, uh, one to merge with the SPAC and the other to merge with the target and both shareholder base migrating to the top of, uh, of this new entity. This is used essentially to accommodate two uh, issues. First, if the SPAC was incorporated in the US uh, and it's merging with a company that the majority of the business is outside the US, uh, it, it may drag taxation for the US simply because the holding company is in the US. So it turns out to be very inefficient. Also, so by forming the vehicle in another jurisdiction, you, uh, uh, are able to uh, 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 avoid that uh, inefficient tax treatment. 
Another way of doing that also is to allow that vehicle now to become what, we, what we're calling the US foreign private issuer, which is uh, foreign companies listed in the US that are subject to a less burden uh, of regulations. So those are the two main drivers to uh, adopt this uh, different alternative. Another key feature that it's now more and more incorporated in the uh, in the, the SPAC deals is, is the pipe piece, right? Uh, pipe standing for uh, private investment in public equity. Um, until we would say a, you know, a year ago, probably, there were not many uh, SPAC deals that would have a pipe component. Um, but the pipe piece uh, uh, brought in two, uh, I think, efficiencies, which is uh, pipe for those that are not familiar with uh, uh, are usually institutional investors buying equity of a public company in a private placement, not in a public offering. The pipe investors have helped in two ways. First, it, it is a, a validation of the valuation. Uh, it, it is curbing a bit of some excessiveness in, in valuations because that there's a double check there, right? There's a, a group of institutional investors that are uh, revising the valuation agreed between the sponsor and the spec and bringing sometimes to more realistic terms. Uh, another aspect that it's interesting on the spec is the, uh, of the pipe is that they are able to secure uh, additional amounts for, for the target company. Uh, if you consider that a spec go public and then raise 200, 300 million, uh, it kind of limits the type of company that it can combine with because you, ha you have to go out around the world looking for companies who are planning to raise the exact amount that you have in the trust account. By adding a pipe, you get, you, uh, the, the spec gains a lot of flexibility of uh, being able to negotiate with a much wider range of companies depending on this, uh, the amount of funds they would uh, be seeking for. So if you have 300 million in, in the trust account as a result of the SPAC IPO, but it, you engage in conversation with a company that we're considering doing an IPO and raising 700 million, you can raise another 400 through a pipe. So it gives a lot of flexibility in terms of uh, scope of companies that uh, the sponsor can uh, engage with. Um, Carlos, Carlos, yes. if you allow me, just before you, you change topic, because uh, one, uh, I, I agree with you, pipe adds a lot of value, but uh, I don't want us to to start speaking in jargon and, and losing uh, half of the audience. But uh, so basically what you're telling me, Carlos, is that this pipe uh, works in two ways. One, it gives you additional cash if you need uh, an extra kick uh, when you are close to the finish line. And in addition to that, and I think probably most importantly, it gives you as what will be equivalent to a seal of approval, right? Uh, because you will have institutional investors coming in. These are the big guys which are well respected and people try to look at them uh, as in some instances as guidance or uh, as you're saying, it's another set of eyes looking at the valuation because usually with evaluations is where people get slightly uh, optimistic and you might end up have, having some valuation which are slightly disconnected from reality or that they do not work out in, in the end. But basically this gives you a seal of approval of someone who has scrutinized, done a full due diligence and turned the company or the projections upside down to, to make it uh, more credible. Is, is that, can we see the pipe as kind of serving these two purposes, basically a seal of approval and an extra kick when you need it? Yes, uh, Rodriguez, it's exactly like that. I think the additional cash, it's, it's very convenient, gives that flexibility. But I think from a, a, a structure standpoint, from a, a market development standpoint, I think the key contribution of the pipe is to give more credibility to the valuation. If you would go to a, a, an IPO process, the price formation, if you go to the book building, it involves discussing with many investors and collecting their intentions of investment and their views on the value of a particular company. Uh, through a traditional SPAC, you have that only one person doing that, which is the sponsor. 
And of course, when there is only one that's subject to mistakes, it's subject to conflicts of interest, of course. Uh, uh, the sponsor might be uh, excessively uh, enthusiastic about a particular business and doesn't see all the risk associated. It has some conflicts of interest as well. Of course, some people say that uh, a bad deal for a sponsor by the end of the two years is better than no deal at all. So sometimes sponsors have some incentives to do uh, uh, or pay more than, than a company is worth. And the pipe investors are essentially traditional institutional investors who will be doing due diligence between the moment of the preliminary agreement, the letter of intent, uh, where it's still non-binding, between that moment and the signing of the definitive documents that are then binding, uh, there is this negotiations with the pipe investors, which will then say, well, I agree with the valuation that you both uh, target company and sponsor provided to me or, or not. I think that's overvalued. And the actual, uh, and that sometimes results in negotiation and redu reductions of the price originally agreed upon. And, and the final price that we'll put on, on the merger agreement, it's actually already negotiated with the pipe investor. So I think that's a big benefit, gives more scrutiny to the, to the process and, and uh, the chances that uh, more reasonable valuations are achieved in the end are higher, but uh, as a result of the pipe. Um, another key feature that it's agreed early on in the process is the sponsor capital commitment. Because uh, until that point, the sponsor has put in very little cash just to advance expenses of the company. Uh, but one of the, the things that will uh, determine whether a, co a company wants to do a deal with a, a SPAC sponsor or, or another, it's how much additional cash that uh, sponsor is willing to put. Uh, and so that's negotiated at that point as well. Uh, so at the closing, the sponsor will put additional cash. And that cash can be uh, usually divided in, in two uh, uh, buckets, if you will. Uh, one, it's together with the pipe. So the additional cash that is raised on the closing of the merger, together with the pipe investors, part is brought by the sponsor itself. So he puts in additional cash it, and, and it brings alignment of interest, right? It's not, he is there just as an intermediary and, and just there for the fee or you know the percentage that he gets from the company. He's putting his own money. It's, it's skin on the game. Skin on the game, yeah. It's skin on the game. So I think that's a line. It's very good. Shows alignment of interest. Uh, and, and so that is a part of the pipe. But also, and that's another evolvement of the market we are seeing now in more recent deals, is uh, what we call a backstop for uh, the cash uh, 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 that is on the trust account. One of the, the uh, things that were being criticized in SPAC deals was that there was uncertainty for the target company that was considering either an IPO or, or, or a merger with a SPAC of how many funds they would get in the end. Because as you pointed out, that there's the redemption feature, right? Shareholders of the SPAC have the right to, to vote against the deal in the end and may uh, redeem the money. But, and that brings some uncertainty to the to the target of how much money there will be available in the end, depending on how many shareholders have redeemed. Sometimes can be significant, 50, 60% of shareholders uh, uh, sometimes are redeeming their shares. Uh, so now targets that have a, a stronger leverage on negotiations are uh, asking the, the sponsor to commit, to compensate with his commitment, the amount of cash that was redeemed by shareholders. So that brings certainty of the amounts available in the end. So that's a very interesting uh, development on the, on, the, on the participation of the sponsor in this process. And I think that uh, deals with some of the critics of the role of the sponsor. Now you see that the sponsor is not someone that's just there for, for the quick run, he's for the long run, right? Um, another aspect that it's interesting when we discuss the capital commitment of the sponsor is that this is a double side negotiation. The sponsor is being asked to commit some money, but on the other side, the sponsor also wants the right to participate in the pipe deal. Because when it becomes a very exciting deal, very uh, you know, attractive company, the pipe will be, will be oversubscribed. There will be a lot of investors wanting to put money in, and then becomes a fine uh, you know, with the bank or a allocation of, of the amount being raised. 
So the sponsor usually tries also to secure some percentage of the pie for himself because usually they are investors, right? The sponsor have its own funds. Uh, sometimes they manage their own money and they managing money from investors. They want to put their money to, to invest in that company as well. Um, another feature that's heavily negotiated and it's been also very dynamic and it's evolving a lot, it's the sponsor promote, right? That you have mentioned in the beginning. For those who are not really familiar, sponsor promote is essentially the compensation for the sponsor for structuring all the deal and finding the target. It, it gets in the end a percentage of the combined company for, for free, essentially. Uh, it usually represents around 15 to 20% of the, the SPAC before the merger. Uh, that has been criticized. Some people say that it's a lot. Uh, and that ha we are seeing some new SPACs, you know, uh, Ackerman's uh, SPAC came without no sponsor promote, for example. And uh, so that's an area of the, the SPAC deals that is evolving a lot. And what we are seeing now that there is a lot of negotiation what happens with the sponsor promote. Some uh, SPAC uh, uh, target companies are asking for simply to for feature a portion of that. So they would give up a portion of their promote. Uh, in some deals, we are seeing that that promote is being subject to uh, an earnout, which also it's an alignment of interest. So the negotiation is, okay, so you have uh, the right to receive X amount of shares. Uh, a third of that you will only receive if and when the price, the trading price after the merger exceeds a certain amount. So I think that's another feature that aligns uh, interest and that's negotiated early on in the process. Another aspect that it's also uh, very much negotiated, it's the lockup. Uh, for those who are not familiar, it's very common in, in IPOs that the shareholders or significant shareholders of the company that's going public, they uh, uh, agree not to trade their shares for a certain period after the IPO. And the idea is to ensure you have a smooth transition from a private to a public company and you don't have excessive uh, offer of shares uh, in the stock exchange right after the IPO, which would bring a pressure down on prices, which would, uh, of course, annoy uh, uh, a lot your new shareholders. So uh, you try to control the offer of shares so you don't have too much people selling on the first days. That's uh, uh, in the SPAC world, that's uh, preserved. You have that feature as well. So a certain percentage of the, the, the target company shareholders agree not to trade for a certain period. Uh, the negotiation there, it's limited on how long. Is it six months? Is it 12 months? So that varies from deal to deal. And, and also, what type of lockup are we agreeing to? Is that a, 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 a cliff one? Like after six months, you're free to trade everything? Or is it phased out? After a certain uh, six, three months, you are able to release a certain portion of it or, or, or sometimes it's linked to the, the price shares. So if the price share of the shares reach a certain level, yeah, the shareholders are able to, uh, uh, to release a portion of their shares. And on the other side, the sponsor also, it's also uh, limited from trading usually for, for six months. Um, Another aspect that it's relevant, it's registration rights. That's also subject to negotiation. Some of the shares that the sponsor will get, the, the shares that the pipe will get, and the shares that the affiliates of the target will get, insiders are going to be restricted. They will not be able to trade immediately after the combination. So the way they will get registered shares, able to trade it, is through a registration rights agreement. And, so, and there's also some negotiations involved. Uh, usually because sometimes there are cutoffs, uh, meaning uh, by the time of the registration, the SEC may say, well, I can't give registration for all those shares on the same time. So you would have to observe some sort of priority, who goes first. And, and there is also negotiations on demand rights, which is assuming that no, uh, not everybody were able to register their shares on the, on, on the, the timing, uh, the first registration process after the the combination, then a group of shareholders 
representing a large chunk of shares have the right to force the company to file a new registration of their shares because that costs money. And, and so that's why it's, it's negotiated on how to limit them. You also have uh, support agreements that are signed. That is, the sponsor wants to make sure that uh, shareholders representing enough quorum to approve the transaction uh, already signing in early on in the process when we sign the definitive documents. Uh, uh, committing to approve the transaction uh, between signing and closing when we have uh, uh, the shareholders vote for that. And, and the sponsor on, the, on their hand also commit to, to vote in favor of the transaction. Some negotiation involved uh, how much of the shareholders will have to sign this, whether they're gonna give proxy to the sponsor to vote on their behalf. So those are the features that are usually negotiated on that type of agreement. Uh, you do negotiate as well at that moment early on, whether there's gonna be some sort of equity compensation scheme uh, for the management. Uh, the sponsor wants to make sure early on that the pipe investors all, uh, and, and shareholders of the SPAC that will have to vote on that know upfront how much dilution they will uh, uh, suffer in the future as a result of equity, equity compensation uh, scheme. So that's also uh, agreed early on in the process. Uh, governance is also a key feature because as we have seen, depending on, on how the governance of this company go forward, it may receive criticism uh, by uh, proxy advisors and as well uh, 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 that can turn the process of approving the transaction by the SPAC investors a challenge. So sponsors are also concerned how the, co the governance of this company will be going forward. And so issues like super voting, you know, having different classes of shares where, where a special class usually held by the founder of the company will have you know, X amount of votes per shares to, to allow it to keep control of the company uh, or not. That's uh, very much discussed. Whether you're gonna have staggered board as a protection for future takeovers on this company. So the governance of how the, the board is gonna be composed is gonna be fully fu uh, chosen by the, the founders uh, of the target company. Will the sponsor have a say on that? Will they have a seat in the board? So all those things are important to be discussed early on. So shareholders are aware of those features when they are called to vote to approve the transaction. Uh, and finally, I think the merger agreement resembles very much uh, a merger agreement of a combination as any other. Uh, you have the merger mechanics, uh, how the, the exchange of uh, securities happen, uh, what are the conditions for closing, uh, and, and interim covenants are also very negotiated. Uh, you want to somehow uh, uh, control uh, how the company performs from signing to closing to make sure that the company uh, reaches the closing very similar to what was agreed. Uh, uh, I think that's trying to keep myself in, in the time we have agreed. I think those were the general uh, key features that are negotiated in a transaction like that, the, the variance that you can find. And of course, I'll be happy to uh, answer further questions uh, uh, during our Q&A time. Carlos, thank you. thank you very much. That was a very good tour de force on the latest uh, and current trends on SPACs. Uh, I'm, you cannot imagine how much I'm already looking forward to our open conversation. I have several questions to ask, but I think that, uh, Daniel, I think that we need to give the floor now to our next speaker. I don't know if you would like to introduce Milos. Or... Milos Ulanovic from EDEF Business School, and who is, of course, one of the major experts in economics in SPACs. Thanks, Milos. OK. Uh... Thank you, Daniel. Thank you, Rodrigo. Thank you uh, for organizing this uh, first SPAC conference in Europe. Hopefully that SPACs are going to come to Europe and be uh, more frequent uh, tools to raise capital in uh, European capital markets as well. Milo, My you're part of Milos the organization. Ulrich. Milo, you're part yeah. of the organization committee. No, no, don't only thank us. You are you were part of this as well. You're part uh, of the yeah, success but, uh, of this. It's, it, it's, <laughs> you did the most uh, most of it. Thank you. 
Uh, my name is Miloš Vlunovic. Uh, I started uh, researching SPACs in 2005. Uh, my mentor uh, told me uh, at the doctoral uh, level studies to pick a topic that no one is exploring. And I was looking around and uh, I was reading, I guess, in Wall Street Journal or Yahoo Finance, the story about SPACs and then uh, started working on SPACs from 2005. So what I'm going to uh, uh, to tell today is a little bit to repeat what Rodrigo said in terms of uh, basic facts and SPACs. And I feel uh, we should be repeating these basic facts and SPACs. SPACs exist from 2003. And I see some major uh, people, let's say in finance literature, they do repeat still major facts. Why? Because uh, maybe in the business community, SPACs are known what they are for, but um, outside, very little people know about SPACs. Uh, so SPACs, they are new asset class. Um, I would say that they started in 2003 to present, although Rodrigo pointed out uh, that they were also uh, functioning in the US capital markets in 90s. Uh, it's true that uh, Gay Chien Capital uh, was one of the leaders in this uh, market of the 90s, but it's also true that in 1997, Security and Exchange Commission uh, uh, took their licenses and uh, forbid them to uh, be participants of the capital markets for a few years. So from two, 1997 to 2003, there was no uh, SPAC. And then again, the same participants, Early Bird Capital and David uh, Nussbaum created the first SPAC uh, Millstream uh, acquisition company in August 2003. Uh, basic facts, SPACs are complex corporate structure. At first, SPAC is a shell, blank check with a purpose. SPAC sponsors together with the underwriters. Um, I miss here lawyers because uh, lawyers are going to uh, kind of explain uh, their part, but lawyers are very important in this process. Uh, with underwriters, bring shelf to the life via IPO. IPO proceeds are uh, used solely for M&A purposes. And that's maybe the question for uh, that Richard posted in the chat. Uh, these proceeds are deposited in the escrow account. They stay over there and they are not used until the point that this escrow is dissolved for the purpose of the merger and acquisition. And then if the merger and acquisition does not happen usually in two years, although this deadline is uh, a stretchable, especially after 2005, then SPAC liquidates. Therefore, acquisition is a goal of all goals for SPACs. Uh, SPACs. They conduct the IPO using units. Unit is a composite security consisting of a common share in warrants. In the beginning of the market, uh, this unit would usually uh, consist of a one common share and two warrants, and these warrants would be in the money. Uh, these days, it goes uh, uh, the opposite. Uh, there is one common share, but warrants are usually out of the money. Not all of the SPACs are able to raise money via the IPO, and they withdraw consequently. Now, overall statistics on the next uh, slide, I'll present a little bit of the statistics, but just to sum it up, the market starts in 2003. The first peak in the, of the market is in 2007. More or less, there was shutdown in 2009 with only one SPAC, slow recovery until 2018, and then boom in the last two years. Um, this is just brief statistics. This is in terms of the absolute numbers. These numbers should be as of uh, July 1st, 368 uh, SPACs out of 525 in the IPO market. So if we take a look in the last three years, 2019, 27% of the market, IPO market, 2020, 55% of the market, and 2021, 70% of the market. It's not only the SPAC frequency, but it's also the SPAC size. Uh, in the last five years, uh, they represent significant uh, size, 20% in 2017, 17, 19, then in 2020, 46% of the IPO market in terms of size, and this year about 60% of the IPO market size. SPACs are going global. They are, there are SPACs in Canada, there are SPACs in Italy, Netherlands, South Korea, Malaysia, UK. Um, so hopefully the market will be growing. 
we can agree that this is backdoor listing for private and foreign companies. Now I'll, I'll speak a little bit on the finance economics literature on SPACs. I would avoid uh, overview of the law literature and I'll put a few major questions or um, dilemmas among the um, research and in finance. Very little published on topics in good journals. Uh, there are like some exceptions. Uh, there are like papers coming at all, paper that examines the likelihood of merger, why and what are the characteristics of these facts that merge. Um, in Journal of Banking and Finance, then there is um, uh, Rodriguez and Stegemoller in Journal of Corporate Finance, Colvin Tikova in Journal of Corporate Finance, Laura Dimitrova in Journal of Accounting and Economics. And this is the uh, survey uh, uh, with Shachmuro and myself in the Oxford Handbook of IPOs. Main topics explored. This is in academic settings. Academics may not necessarily uh, see what the practitioners see. Uh, they may have different views, but we try to collect good statistics. And I can tell you, uh, um, I was uh, trying to uh, execute or to do a research on one uh, topic, which is uh, whether the serial shareholders are more successful, uh, serial SPAC sponsors are more successful in uh, uh, merger likelihood. And uh, um, my co-author is one of the uh, practitioners um, in the SPAC market. And uh, the statistics result uh, show that if early bird capital is participating as one of the uh, underwriters, the likelihood of the merger is the highest. And she didn't agree, she didn't agree uh, she said, okay, but maybe it was in the past, not anymore, or simply uh, didn't want to, uh, to give uh, um, support to that argument. Although statistically, um, no matter what the procedure was, it has been shown that, let's say, in the sample from 2003 to 2018, if the early bird there was there, the likelihood of the merger was uh, uh, higher. So, uh, the main topics discussed return to shareholders at the various stages. Usually our study is examined at the announcement date, at the merger, post-merger and similarly, then merger likelihood and determinants, post-merger survival and post-merger performance. Now, obviously as the new market, uh, as the SPACs picked uh, um, the strength, there is new wave of research and the importance was recognized in 2020 and interest of well-known researchers was triggered. I put here four papers that caused a lot of attention, especially this first one. This is paper by Klausner, Ulrich, and Ruan, a sober look at SPACs, which uh, it's one of the top downloaded papers on SSR. Everyone was seems reading it, and I guess it had impact on the Security and Exchange Commission uh, to put a little bit stop on the SPAC market. Uh, then uh, there is uh, Professor Ritter, Jay Ritter, who is in academic circles, uh, probably the most uh, known person uh, that explains IPO and the finances of the IPO. Uh, we two co-authors uh, wrote the paper SPACs. Then um, uh, students, uh, PhD students from Harvard University that went, uh, one of them went to Chicago, uh, um, Urbana, uh, reaching for the guild. And then uh, this uh, Lynn Lou, Michelli and Quinn sponsor centrality and kind of performance. So this is a kind of, uh, uh, so good sign. Uh, it's a very good sign that these most famous people in uh, uh, the finance markets are finally examining SPACs. But what is uh, um, not good about these uh, most famous people? Uh, they want to start things from the scratch, uh, often ignoring probably what these small people in the past did. Uh, they kind of want to establish uh, 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 things on their own. Uh, and I guess uh, in that they are missing uh, many points. So for example, Klaus et al, which was the most publicized study and the most downloaded, uh, most quoted uh, studies back market only for the last two years. Their sample is very small, around 50 SPACs, 47 SPACs. And based on these 47 SPACs, they subscribed the policy. And I guess the Security and Exchange Commission was very much listening to them. At some point, I was questioning 
whether the Security and Exchange Commission asked them to write the, the paper so they can uh, have good uh, uh, grounds to um, kind of uh, stop a little bit the market. Uh, this uh, Gang Greater and Zhang also kind of um, parceled the sample and start looking at SPACs from 2010. Uh, my understanding is that they do this for two reasons. It's very hard to compile comprehensive data set because the data from early years is missing and also market data on the performance of the warrants is missing. And the second thing is that results are hard to differentiate from early papers published in low rank journals or working versions posted on SSR. So marginal contribution is not that big if you really want to kind of do comparison with level and, and some other papers. And then um, they want to kind of invent something new, but not necessarily capturing the, um, the issues uh, of the SPACs. And the first thing is where I think there is discrepancy of this lifestyle of the SPACs. Levelen uh, clearly states the timeline. If you think about the events, it's uh, um, from the IPO to um, announcement of the acquisition, and then from the announcement to the merger, and then or to the vote, and then after the merger. But there is a push to relabel this with not much support in the way house packs work. I think that this pack period is not well understood, and transition from SPAC to new company is very much blurred. Uh, is it because they want these papers to succeed and to offer something different, or just like um, still they didn't spend uh, much time over there? I don't know. But uh, I guess the uh, much more has to be uncovered. From a research point of view, I think this, this SPAC and the difference between what SPAC means and the understanding that this merger is actually exit for most SPAC sponsors and that after the SPAC merger, uh, this is the performance of the new company that was previously uh, private. Uh, that is something that is not recognized. And then uh, poor performance of these private companies that become SPAC is kind of mixed uh, with the performance of the SPAC, which is simply cash shell. And this should not be uh, compared, but it should be, uh, it should be looked like with uh, much little bit understanding. So I just want to thank again, organizers. Uh, I try to be brief. And, but I would be happy if there is um, any question or we did together um, discuss questions. Uh, my understanding is that this um, seminars, two days talking of SPACs is just to uh, bring audience uh, to uh, research more uh, the subject, to see the uh, importance of the SPACs and uh, maybe to participate in the market. Okay, thank Milos, you. Milos, Milos, thank you very much. And um, that was, as I think probably all presentations of SPACs, they are provocative because they are new to many of us and, and there are many, many food for thought, many issues to keep on considering. Uh, so uh, we will continue our conversation in the, in the Q&A session. So now I'm, what I would like to do is I would like to introduce our last speaker, Dr. Daniele Dalvia. Uh, co-organizer or the, organi the main organizer of the event and, and, and he is also sitting at the Institute for Global Law, Economics and Finance at Queen Mary University of London. Daniele, the floor is all yours. Thank you very much, Rodrigo. Can you see my screen? No? We can see it. Okay, let me try to see if I can enlarge. Maybe now is better. Better. Exactly. <laughs> So thanks uh, everyone for coming to this conference and actually to investigate SPACs because as Milos was highlighting to you, SPACs are a very new recent phenomenon in the public uh, space. Why? Because of course SPACs uh, are uh, investment vehicles that at least uh, more than 20 years ago were there in the US. Although of course uh, 20 years is nothing if you think so. We are speaking about, for sure, a new animal, a new creation that is continuously developing. So this is another key point to keep in mind. And it's also one of uh, uh, the main topics that uh, I spoke uh, when 
I was in the US in 2017 that I won that, that prize from the American Society of Comparative Law. Actually, that paper is showing how SPACs are evolving, how the regulation of SPACs will evolve one day. And actually that day has come. Today, we have seen that uh, regulators around the world are questioning from India to Singapore, to UK, to US, to Italy, to Amsterdam. And in fact, even tomorrow, I mean, we have uh, uh, the head of listing from Euronext and Euronext is very supportive about SPACs. And uh, of course, I mean, uh, it's also questioning how we can improve the regulation, if we can improve the regulation of these uh, investment vehicles. So the main question was always, uh, uh, I mean, uh, can market practice be regulated or there is a standardization of those market practices or is better like a very technical law uh, approach from the state, from a third actor that is the state that is coming in and is starting to regulate everything. And this question, as I said, still applies today and is part actually of a new question. What are the key features to make a SPAC successful? And what were the main ingredients in some way that make then a SPAC successful during time? In fact, in this uh, presentation, I will present a, a very briefly a case study, one of the best case study in SPACs, and even at the start of the phenomenon of the big uh, boom of SPACs in 2020, that is DraftKings. And then uh, we will see a little bit the role of operators, managers in SPACs, the role of, of self-regulation that uh, just is connects to the question that we said before, that is the question is better to regulate or not to regulate, and then uh, uh, the concluding remarks. So just to start with uh, our uh, example, we speak about uh, a SPAC quite big that was Diamond Eagle and uh, raised uh, 400 million in proceeds in May 2019. And as you can see, there are three steps as, I mean, even uh, Carlos has outlined, Milos, uh, Rodrigo, outlined, uh, we have the SPAC IPO, the reverse merger, that is the takeover. So it's when the private company, in this case, the private company was DraftKings, a company operating uh, in uh, sports betting, was taking over Diamond Eagle. In fact, in the second step, you can see how the reverse mergers was performed, like uh, there was this merger between Diamond Eagle and uh, DraftKings, where DraftKings was uh, taking over Diamond Eagle. And uh, uh, the new company has more than 500 million of cash on its balance sheet. And the equity value of this transaction was uh, uh, stabilized at uh, 3.2 billion USD dollars. And then finally, the step that everyone is looking for, that is the moment where uh, the private companies became in public. And here uh, you can see what even uh, Carlos actually was saying before, where we have a very big role that is played in some way by the pipe investors, so the private investment in public equity. And that is a key feature of the SPAC because if we have like a high number of redemption, in some way the pipe can mitigate the risk that the sponsor will not have cash than to pay the equity uh, price and the equity value of that transaction. But the puppy investors can also multiply the possibility to have a bigger target. And so this kind of formula, magic formula, where the SPAC is going to target uh, target companies that are at least four to eight times even bigger than the value that is in the escrow account of the SPAC is due to the pipe investors. Pipe investors are very well known and, and common practice today in the US, even because the regulatory framework in the US is uh, good for them. So like uh, has been extended also the definition very recently during the SPAC boom of pipe investors and so who is an accredited investors, uh, institutional investors. And this has allowed the possibility for a uh, pipe market to grow. In, the, in Europe, uh, this is not the same. The majority of SPACs in Europe, and especially in Italy, 
we don't see five investors in those deals. And uh, uh, the same is true even in the UK. It's not something that there were some critiques also under English law. So um, I predict that this model of pipe investors will continue to follow the path of the US. In Europe is something that we still have to see, but for sure for how is the market practices in SPAC, probably uh, we should rethink also to regulate or to at least promulgate something to encourage or protect pipe investors because our key in SPACs as this example is showing at the end of the day, they had a percentage of 12% with 13% of post investors that they retain their shares in the deal. And then the majority of shareholders that are coming from the reverse takeover are from Draft Kings shareholders with 75% and the market cap of the whole company that was 12 billion. So Draft Kings is one of uh, the most successful deals because then as we can see from the second slide uh, and this uh, was taken as picture just from yesterday is a stock that is today is trading uh, 49 per share so it's quite good although we have uh, for example uh, everything depends because we have also some sponsor that they did even better than this uh, draft king uh, today has uh, increased also the market cap so this is another good sign. And it's one of the most successful SPACs in terms of value creation. Why I speak about value creation? Because many times uh, economists like Dimitrova and others, uh, they are uh, a little bit fighting SPACs saying that SPACs are value destroying. So as opposed to this view, we can say, or it's fair to say that at least we start to see and even we will see in the future with Grab transaction, 40 billion valuation, SPACs, they can create value, but they can create value at certain conditions. In fact, uh, I would like to highlight here uh, wh why uh, this SPAC was su successful. Diamond Eagle uh, is not a SPAC by chance because it was created by a very well-known uh, sponsor that had almost 40 years of experience in the media and entertainment industries. And they already, I mean, uh, uh, sponsored other SPACs before in 2017, in 2015, and, and so on and so forth. So what we can see is that the sponsor, the team of managers there, they have a strong track record and experience in money management. And of course, experience in mergers and acquisitions because they closed other deal in a successful way. And those facts mainly were sector focused and they had a very specific plan. So this is something that is also part of the critiques on SPACs that they say, you raise this money in a blind pool and you don't have then a plan. You are going like a little bit blind on the market. Actually, that is not really the story because I mean, if you go in Italy with investment banks, in Europe with investment banks, or you speak even with investment banks in any case in US, you have a little bit to have a plan. There is an info memo that the people they have to write. This is uh, something that I understand sometimes academic that are less connected to the practice. They cannot see, but actually, I mean, uh, there is always the possibility uh, and there must be the possibility to have a plan because otherwise, I mean, also an underwriter will not uh, go to underwrite the project in the SPAC if you don't have a clear idea. For sure, what I would like to highlight is that if you are sector focused, is a, a big advantage, could be potentially a big advantage. These are all things that are still on the movement. So we still have to evaluate if this is true or not. Although, of course, this, this is connected to the role of operators and managers. And so here, just to have a little bit of fun, I put one of the uh, famous songs, Smooth Operator. So can we have an epic uh, team of managers, uh, Smooth Operators in SPACs? And this is a very recent study from Wolf Research, uh, just published, I think, a few days ago. And this is showing to you that the value creation process, so the fact that then once we have the share that is trading on the market, the value of the share 
the, of the shares are increasing exponentially, we can see from one month, three months, six months, one year, if there is an experienced team that is leading that, uh, the spark. So we have at least, uh, I mean, if the team is experienced, 73% of exponential growth in the in value creation in some way in the spark. So basically what I would like to say, maybe from this data, we can infer that uh, the sponsors uh, are very important in sparks. They must be expert. And probably from the example before of Diamond Eagle, if the spark is sector focused, can help. Let's go to self-regulation very quickly. Basically, this is the uh, classic question that I was saying before between codified and uncodified market practices. And as Rodrigo said, uh, we like uh, in some way self-regulation and codified market practices, but this is not something that should be seen uh, necessarily, I mean, as a war. This is something based on the need of the market and the market pa participants. And uh, this graphic, I think, is good to show you, apart from an economic point of view, how the SPAC has uh, evolved during time uh, until the peak from 2019, 2021. 20, we had like a very huge, uh, I mean, peak in, in SPACs uh, offerings and listings. Is to show you that actually we can see in SPACs that there are some market practices that have been codified in the listing requirements of uh, uh, New York Stock Exchange and NASDAQ, and other market practices that are still uncodified. They have not been codified, but they are key. They are key for the success of the SPARC. And I would like to highlight here three of them, the main one in some way, at least in my view, the tender offer that uh, always start from a market practice, always start so from a SPAC, real SPAC, where in negotiation with the SEC, they see if a tender offer in lieu of uh, a redemption right can be uh, implemented in the SPAC transaction. And actually it was 17th Street General Acquisition Corporation that proposed this model. Actually the CSC was giving the green light. And then from that moment on, that market practice became a listing requirement. I mean, not a listing requirement, but the possibility that is given to uh, the issuers. And this is uh, highlighted from the fact that uh, New York Stock Exchange, NASDAQ, they started to propose this real change to their listing requirements and to give, to sponsor the possibility of having a tender offer. Tender offers are not frequent, but are possible. So they can give extra flexibility to your SPAC. Then uh, without going to much details, this is the uh, redemption right, the coupling. So the redemption right and voting right that are separated as Rodrigo was explaining at the start. And I would like to say that this feature actually in particular is fair to say that uh, is from Douglas Elenoff. It was Douglas Elenoff that actually was negotiating with the Security and Exchange Commission in the US, uh, the possibility to have this in 2010 and actually it was a SPAC GSME that uh, could have that through Douglas Elenoff and this uh, negotiation with the CIC. And there uh, successfully, I mean, uh, subsequently, they, uh, the SPACs, they started uh, to implement uh, de facto this kind of feature. That actually is not a listing requirement. Of course, this is a corporate law uh, matter, so it's fine that uh, stays like that. Although this is something that is successful for sure and uh, is very good in the US, but actually it's very good in the SPAC rational because uh, in this way, every time that uh, a board of managers is going to propose a business combination, the shareholders in some way, they are free. I mean, even if they vote not to that business proposal, business combination, they can still uh, redeem their shares and then keep the warrant. So stay still in, in the game. And this is something very important, why? Because in Europe, we have a very variegated system of uh, um, redemption rights because we have uh, 27 today member states that I mean, uh, with 27 different legal frameworks in corporate law. 
So there is always this conflicting issue. And in Italy, especially the last sparks in 2020, they were liquidated because of this, because they didn't have this possibility to redeem the share and then to vote in favor or against the business combination. So this kind of separation was not possible. And this is one of the main challenge. And this is something that, of course, uh, some sponsor like Mr. Arietti, recently on the alternative investment market with a new SPAC is trying to, uh, in some way, provide some solutions. But to, oh, actually, I mean, always something that is going beyond the line. And then uh, uh, we have the last one that is PAC 3.5. So it means that actually uh, is the possibility to have a fractional warrant structure. And this is something that was started in, to be implemented a lot of times uh, in recently in 2019, 2020, in the, all the last parks, uh, they have this possibility because it's a possibility that can give you an incentive uh, to buy more shares. And it's also giving in, in any case uh, to investors the possibility to have more warrants. Then uh, just very briefly on the concluding remarks uh, and to summarize uh, three main uh, points uh, from this presentation. The fact that successful operators so in terms of managers, the um, selection or right managers is key in SPACs. So it's not only to find uh, the big star uh, that can attract money. You can find that, but can not only be based on that. You should always have a team that is composed by different figures. So a SPAC expert, someone that is a star, someone that is very expert in the industry that you are going to target. Non suffocating regulation, because as we can see, uh, we have seen, uh, I mean, uh, there are market practices that sometimes have been codified and is good once uh, these things are in the listing requirements. Other times in terms of corporate law, if we have like a flexible legal framework, uh, it's always better for this kind of vehicles that are dynamic, uh, are like Bitcoin. You cannot regulate actually Bitcoin. They change continuously and they're based on market practices, even Bitcoin. So in some way, the regulation should protect, and this I agree with Rodrigo for sure, and I'm not unreasonable on this, should protect retail investors if there are, that in any case are the, I mean, it's not the main feature of SPAC, retail investors, but actually if there are, we should give protection to them, at least in terms of financial literacy. What I always wrote in my papers, in my book on SPACs that uh, is forthcoming in 2021 November, is that uh, financial literacy actually can help uh, not only SPACs, even Bitcoin, all the financial innovations. So innovation became an asset class on which we invest, like we invest in commodities, in bonds, in stocks. Today we invest in innovation, and it is the future actually. And and also the future for regulators. And then finally, the sector focus packs, of course, so these are preliminary data, but can be a suggestion that if you are sector focused and you have a clear idea on what you are going to do with your SPAC, probably you will be successful. Thank you very much. Daniele, thank you very much for your presentation. And I would like to do, what I would like to do now is to invite uh, all speakers to join in a conversation. Uh, and I've been following both, uh, try to multitask, following the presentation, but also looking uh, at the chat uh, to see what are the questions that have been coming up more frequently. And I would like to start with a very, very quick question to all three of you. Uh, and I will probably start in the order that you presented to, to give Daniele at least a, a minute or so to rest is, and I will start with, with Carlos. Uh, why sparks are getting so much bad publicity lately? Um, that's a good question, Rodrigo. Uh, I think that there is probably uh, two reasons. I think one, and the obvious one, is that uh, it, it became overheated, the market, right? So all of a sudden, all the financial, legal, 
uh, journalism com community was surprised by seeing the, the increased and in, you know Miller's uh, presentation show the, the the sharp increase in the number of, of IPOs of, of specs and, and the size of it so that per se draws a lot of attention by by media coverage but I, I don't think that that explains all uh, I think that would uh, bring some headlines for just a couple of months not a continuing discussion I think that as any new, I think uh, Danielle was, was talking about innovation. I think any new product, any, any new asset class uh, brings uh, uh, questions. People are still trying to figure out what is it? How, the, how does it work? And, and of course, there is always a sense of uh, uh, who is tricking who on this, right? There's, there's this feeling that sponsors are somehow taking advantage of, of the poor retail investors and, and regulators you know, should be doing something. You know, a lot of uh, academics and journalists are urging regulators to, to step in and protect the poor uh, uh, investors. So I think that's, there's a sense of uh, evil and good. You know, someone is taking advantage of someone here uh, and making a lot of money. And I think that's why I love I love your last bit. Who is tricking who? <laughs> uh, so basically, the reason why there's so much bad publicity is because of mankind. Because we need to try to find who is tricking who. <laughs> but, someone but, is doing bad to someone. <laughs> I, 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 I originally when I drafted in my notes the question, I was when I was listening to you, I was taking some notes. I say, and my initial reaction why why sparks are getting so much bad publicity with a sub question, which I didn't post to you, which is, is it jealousy? And I think that that, that, that builds on the, on the who is tricking who. Let's pause there, Carlos. I'm going to come back to this. Uh, Milos, why are, why are Spice getting so much bad publicity lately? Uh, I would say, uh, this is maybe uh, an orthodox view, but I would say that uh, a regulator is understaffed. Uh, the Security and Exchange Commission is understaffed that, uh, and they're afraid. They're afraid that uh, uh, they would not be able to control the market. They're understaffed to fully understand it, even if it's, if it's not that complex to understand it. And they were favorably uh, uh, looking at these few studies that caused like this story uh, uh, that sparks uh, uh, having something bad or exploiting someone. If you really take a look uh, at the structure of the SPAC, first, SPAC is completely risk-free to investors. There is no possibility to lose money because sponsors put it to risk capital to pay for underwriting fee, legal expenses, and similarly, and deposit, especially in the last decade, entire proceeds from the IPO in the trust account. So every investor can always withdraw the money. They can sell the shares in the market, or they can wait to this uh, merger day to sell uh, the share at the pro rata basis, which is always covering the trust amount. So uh, plus they have a fraction of the warrant. So therefore no investor being my cat or being the most skilled investor can lose money. And uh, uh, the fact that uh, investors in SPACs historically are not retail investors. They are the largest hedge funds. I don't buy the story that they are worried about retail investors. So no one can lose money in the SPAC. What are people can lose money is in this post merger transaction, but that's a different kind of game. So I think the, the major achievement for the SPAC market should be to differentiate between what the SPAC is and what the new company is happening after the reverse merger into the SPAC of the private company in SPAC. So I think no one should be protecting because no one, uh, no one can guarantee super positive returns, but no one can lose money in the SPAC market. So in short, I think regulator was afraid. Uh, and I think uh, some people, uh, they don't want to fully uh, uh, understand it, but they want to use uh, the fact that they're famous and to create stigma on SPACs. Finally, we saw yesterday that Dow Jones is at the highest point in, in, in the market. So I guess people have a lot of choices uh, what they want to invest. So if if there are like 368 SPACs this year, a Dow Jones is at the record high ever, and the markets are at the record high ever, I it's a testimony of something. So I don't think so that um, 
Uh, Milos, Milos, I, I, I agree with you on that the regulator is under staff. Uh, I'm not sure I, I buy entirely the conspiracy theory, but let me play here. What conspiracy? I'll... Can you, uh, what is the conspiracy? No, no, the fact that basically since they are, because uh, the bad publicity is not coming just from the regulators, basically coming from from some academics, it's coming yeah, from Yeah, I would press. say these academics are, are, are kind of, uh, let's say your law professor, are probably the, the best position from academia where you go is to the Security and Exchange Commission or be uh, cooperating together with the Security and Exchange Commission. So I would say that uh, they uh, uh, on purpose uh, uh, did the study, but I can tell you there is no point that law professors do a uh, study on the financial performance of SPACs. There are like much more economics and finance professors who are equipped to calculate your returns and, and do methodology. And uh, if, if two law professors are, are kind of explaining returns to SPACs, I I, I, Milos, would, uh, I, I, I agree with you. It will yeah. be irresponsible of a law professor to do a financial analysis because we are not trained. That's, to do that. that's what they did. I do not judge on what colleagues do. I'm just making a statement that basically, if you're a lawyer, you should focus on the law. But uh, I, on that, I agree with you, Milos. Um, Daniele, why yeah. are SPACs getting a little bit of bad publicity? Yes, uh, thanks, Rodrigo. In my view, uh, I think that everything came uh, even from the fact that, uh, as I said in my presentation, there were uh, star, movie star uh, from Hollywood and so on that they started to get involved. And as I said, this is something that, okay, of course, can even be cool in the sense that in the end, investors, they like to put money on their favorite movie actor and so on, can attract capital, um, I don't know, an actor from Hollywood. The only fact is that you don't have only an actor from Hollywood, you should not, at least. So that is a concern, of course, uh, but I think that that is so straightforward that even the most naive investor uh, will understand because on the SPAC, we need to say that there is uh, a prospectus. So there is an S1 form where uh, it is uh, stated the risk, uh, the, fa the risk factors are stated. Uh, there is the structure of the company, of the management, uh, their track record, their expertise. They went in uh, road shows before. So even investors that they start to buy in the stock are not something, I mean, are not investors that they see for the first time in the SPAC on the market. So the, the main thing is this, that of course the bad reputation starts to be, uh, especially on the fact that um, sponsor, uh, sometimes they involve this kind of figures that are not professional. And sometimes sponsors, uh, as the Financial Times has defined the SPAC Bonanza. So the fact that, uh, at least in the US, is quite heavy in the sense that uh, while I can see that in Europe, we have a more solid base. So in some way, the sponsor usually doesn't bet on the warrant and there is less dilution of investors because we don't buy warrants, we buy preference shares. So uh, everything is based on stock, real economy, equity, uh, warrants are an hybrid instrument between debt and equity. So in the US, then uh, this sponsor, they start to bet on the warrant. Then once there is the SPAC transaction, they exercise the warrants and they dilute the investors. That is uh, something that in any case is part of the game. You can even have uh, in the US a SPAC that uh, uh, doesn't have warrants. You can have even uh, common stock, but you need a very good management, very, very well-known managers with a big track record. And why? Because in, a, in any case, uh, they don't put really a big skin in the game. And so they don't put because they are always successful. So this is uh, a possibility that can be made in the US, but at certain condition. So I think uh, this is one of the reasons why the SPAC Bonanza, the fact that, I mean, uh, from a minimum investment, the sponsor could get uh, millions out of it. Okay, so basically, Daniele, I think that, that you are kind of moving towards, or not moving towards, but not necessarily moving towards, but probably aligning with Carlos to an extent that basically uh, it's a new asset class. And, and I think that probably all three positions can boil down to basically the fear of, of the uncertain. And I think that basically 
there's an element of that in, in all three responses. Probably the one which is, might be a little bit more far-fetched would be on, on Milos. But Milos, tell me if I can uh, try uh, follow this line of, of discussion. Because one thing that I would like to do is, with the three of you, is probably try to dissect this new beast, the SPAC, that everybody fears. Because I, what I'm seeing with SPACs is that uh, there's really nothing new. It's basically, it's just the combination of different existing tools. But I want, that's why I want you, to, I, I would like to have the advantage that I have three SPAC experts, uh, two on the legal side, one the, on the economic side, and, and I have this conversation to demystify the the apparent myth of SPACs. Because basically, but chip in and tell me if I'm wrong on something. So basically, you create a company, right? Investors buy a participation in the company, right? The company has no assets, but investors, when they buy a participation in the company know that the company has no assets and in the future they will buy something and they decide to take that risk, right? Guys, right. Uh, Miller, Carlos, Daniel, please correct me at some point if I'm getting something wrong. And with this, what they do is then at some point they decide to acquire a company, which is something that's been happening for not decades, centuries. So what I'm trying to understand is what are we fearing? Where is the risk, if any, which Miller already told us that there's no risk. So, and the reality is that what the new development is that by combining different small transactions or techniques that were already in existence, now, because basically this combines elements of a pure plain vanilla MA with a reverse takeover uh, or a reverse merger uh, where we have different types of financing, equity, equity with a sweetener, which is the warrant. Uh, we can have a pipe that works as a seal of approval or what we will, if we want to do a parallelism with private equity, would be kind of another tranche or another layer in this kind, in this case of equity, uh, then you buy a company. In between, you might have a couple of additional agreements, like for example, uh, a lock, a lock-in agreement or a lock-up agreement. And but really, the, we will perform a due diligence for the acquisition. There will be a value, of, a value determination. We were going to discuss value because that came up constantly on, on the chat box. But am I missing something here, or do you? I agree with me. I agree, Rodrigo. Uh, I think it is exactly what, it, what you, how you put it. Nobody is inventing the wheel here. Uh, so there is no feature, I would put it, that it's so regional that nobody can understand it. It's something that people have put together, a series of uh, uh, warrants, uh, 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 redemptions. Uh, a lot of features that already exist. They were not created for that. It simply was a smart way of, uh, let, let's put it simple. Uh, there is excess of liquidity in the market, right? There's a lot of money, uh, very low interest rates, buyback programs by the federal government, uh, a lot of money in the hands of uh, uh, ma fund managers, so investors, they need to put to work. And there's not enough uh, uh, assets out there to, to receive that capital. And, and the market has naturally devol developed uh, an, a new asset class that's very attractive, as, as Milos has pointed, first because of its uh, low risk. If you don't like the, the, the opportunity, you can withdraw uh, with no losses. So it's low risk with an upside. So that's what we were talking, I think, before. Uh, uh, I think it's a very smart asset because it, it creates the advantages for all the parts involved. The investors have a good opportunity of an upside with low risk. Sponsors 
are, able, are deal makers. So they are making the wheel turn round. They are making deals and that's how they make money. And for the companies is a valuable, interesting alternative to go public where they have more control in the process, more control on the, on the valuation. So everybody's gaining something on here. Uh, I, going back to our joke, you can trick someone sometime, but you cannot trick everyone all the time. So yeah. if it was that bad, it, was, it would not be you know, for such a long time uh, uh, so attractive. Uh, so I don't think there's a, a, nothing hidden here. No, no one is really taking advantage of anybody. Uh, someone may criticize some of the features, uh, while someone may say that the promote, it's excessive. And, and the market react, uh, and that's that. This dialogue that's very, I think, uh, profitable because an interesting uh, sponsors are reacting to the criticism and saying, okay, if you if the market perceives that the promote it's too much, let's reduce it, let's uh, make it smaller, let's uh, bind to to result. So I think that's very positive. And and, and going back to the regulation discussion, I, I think that. Uh, the, the risk is that if regulators step in and try to, to put it, uh, you know, Carlos, uh, can, Carlos can, can I hold you on that one? Because basically you are going to, you're going to exhaust all my questions in one answer. <laughs> uh, can, l l let's leave the regulation discussion for later. So basically, can we do, or would you agree that it will be reasonable today to do kind of a parallelism with securitization? Because in securitization, what you have is you don't have anything new. You just pull together different tools or resources that you have, which basically are a sale purchase agreement. Uh, you have a few service agreements, and then you have a issuance of bonds, and, and that's pretty much it, or notes, whatever. But basically, so you combine them together, and what you have is a nice piece of structured finance. And, and here, I think that basically there's this whole craze around SPACs. And Milos, I would like to see your take on it, uh, but I think that basically, there's that's why I think that it's it's worth spending some time demystifying the myth because basically, uh, and Daniel, that's a very nice topic for a next conference. Demystifying the myth because the reality that there's there's no new element that that justifies this bad publicity in the market there eh? because basically people fearing the the unknown but the reality that there are no unknown but here yeah. you have many knowns put together yes milos i would say there are not unknowns for finance community for lawyers for people who are in the ecosystem of sparks there is not unknowns but there is for public and uh, some people uh, who came very late to the game i would again uh, put this klausner uh, as as the leaders of this uh, field they just look in the partial in 50 SPACs and they said, all SPACs are bad. I just want to repeat, from the point of the IPO to the point of the merger, the only it's SPAC is a risk-free investment for yeah. investors. Yeah. The only people who could lose money are actually the SPAC sponsors. And they have this at-risk capital. They buy predetermined number of the warrants and usually they commit. Their commitments up to 10, 10, 15 millions of dollars. So that's what they can lose. If the SPAC dissolves and they couldn't find the target, that money is going to be lost in most of the cases. Now, the losses happen after the merger or the wins happen after the merger. But I would agree there is nothing kind of new. I would just add to the Carlos point. It's true, SPAC sponsors reacted. But if you think about it, the market was changing and there is evaluation of uh, evolution of the SPAC market because at the beginning of the market one unit would give you one share and two warrants and these two warrants would be in the money so investors were really getting good deals now the market evolved and investors are getting one share and maybe one third of the warrants and this warrant is out of the money that's where the market brought us so Majority of the investors, again, are hedge funds. They are supporting the market from the beginning of 2003 to 2021. And as you said, there is nothing new. Majority of the investors are institutions. The larger investment banks are now players in the markets. Good law firms are in the markets. Good auditors are in the markets. And uh, the market is booming. 
I just don't see what is this retail investor punished? Milos, Milos, okay. And why, Milos. why suddenly concern for this retail investor? Milos, so basically the main takeaway is that uh, you said it before and you repeat it now, is that basically this is risk free until the moment of the M&A. Uh, the M &A. Correct. And, and, every, after, and the markets and markets are liquid. Every investor can withdraw at any point, even at the merger day. Milos, Milos, perfect. And then from then onwards, it's the capital markets. It's the capital markets. But shares go up, is, shares go down. Exactly. But the point is, with this new company, majority of the SPAC sponsors, they withdraw, they exited. So they stay maybe with, with the lock cups or something like this, they may have ownership, but they are not in the board. Usually maybe a quarter of them would stay on the board of new company. They would exit, they would form new SPAC. And then the managers of this private company would manage this new public company. So we should not blame performance of this private company, for example, Virgin Atlantic or anyone on the SPAC sponsor who brought the public, yeah? Or, or, or similarly. So we should, maybe examining more of these private companies into which we invest. Yeah, but again, yeah, 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 even, yeah, but... sorry, even this misperformance, uh, I listened to presentation of Jay Ritter, I didn't see it in writing, but I know most of these studies didn't calculate the performance of warrants, but when you calculate the performance of the warrants, maybe SPACs are not uh, uh, misperforming that much as uh, it said, but the point is, and I mentioned this in my presentation, uh, uh, this uh, Klausner and many other studies, they were not systematically able to collect data on the warrants. M Milos, warrants but, 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 but again, the unit, yeah? again, I think that basically then we are kind of slightly diverging because if they perform or not perform, that's a completely different story. Exactly. It's a completely it's different story. Basically, yeah, yeah, exactly. People, basically, the regulator or investors, they can make right or wrong decisions. But basically, bottom line, if you lose money, you can lose money with basically any public listed company uh, or any investment whatsoever, even if it's listed or not. Basically, there are some assets that can depreciate, some assets that appreciate. And, and that's, that's how basically the free market operates. Uh, but that has nothing to do with necessarily SPACs. That, that has to do with investment decisions, the right or wrong investment decisions, uh, and, and other external factors. Yeah. Like a pandemic, so, like a natural disaster, like anything really. Choice of target. I mean, yeah, but yeah, 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 yeah. Of course, I, I don't need, I, I want to move away from the technical element because basically anybody can relate to the pandemic, anybody can relate to a hurricane or an earthquake. Basically, if we are going to discuss what would be the performance of the of the shares of company X in three months from now, that that might become slightly more technical. But 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 that's the essence of the market and how they operate. Daniele, yes. so uh, I mean, uh, what, what's the problem here? Jealousy? Uh, late entrance in the market? No, no, don't don't be scared. Daniele said jealousy, and, and Daniele was thinking, what, <laughs> what what have I done? No, Daniele, I'm I'm referring to basically jealousy. I mean, uh, people joining uh, late to what look like a trend that people said, okay, this is not going to get anywhere, and now it's it's very big, or because basically uh, we have seen we have seen probably from from a discussion with with Carlos, Carlos and Milos, is that basically uh, it is risk free. There's nothing really new, and if there's anything, it's a potential upside. What you can have, and this is where uh, apparently, based on the conversation with Milos, my takeaway and Milos, you know that you can any of the three can step in at any time and contradict me or tell me, Rodrigo, you're talking nonsense. Basically. There's some inconclusive data on the performance of some of the SPACs because they're not taking into account also the performance of the warrant. So basically it's just a plain equity, but which bottom line is a mistake on your investment because of because that can happen with any equity on the capital market. But if you take into account of if you add into that total performance, the value of the warrant, you might still be making money despite of the uh, underperformance of the equity security. But Daniele, so 
give me a one-liner. Give me a one-liner because we need to, to change topic. We need to move into valuation and regulation. So tell me yeah, in one-liner, what is your yes, main takeaway? One-liner, I would like to draw the comparison with Uber. Like in the end, uh, once Uber started, there was a revolution and everyone was against Uber. And still today, I mean, uh, some countries, they are making uh, the life of Uber more difficult, but today is a global phenomenon. So I think as you take the Uber, you take a spark. Okay. So why don't we do a spark and, of Uber or, or Lyft or any of the others, and then you, you can bring both together. Okay. Thank you, Daniele. Uh, question for all of you. Uh, this is something that has been coming up constantly on the on the chat box more than once, the issue of enterprise value. How do we fix enterprise value in advance? Uh, I think that the first one to ignite that debate was um, Carlos, Carlos was the one who said that one of the biggest advantages is that we can fix the enterprise value in advance. Carlos, I don't know if you can uh, enlarge a little bit on that. And I prefer to pick on you rather than on Milos, because for lawyers, I think that they will relate better to you, Carlos, than with Milos. But I will I will cover both both sides, the finance and the legal side. Carlos, would you like to tell us a little bit more in, in layman terms? Uh, how do we fix the enterprise value in advance? Sure. Uh, just quickly before answering your question, uh, there was a question in chat from Luis about uh, conflict of interest uh, that I would like to briefly answer, which is how do you, and that's one of the very few areas where we have seen actually litigation involving SPACs, which is when SPAC sponsors try to make the SPAC merged with, with a company that the sponsor is already also a shareholder. So there was a clear conflict of interest when negotiating exchange uh, ratios. I think that's a big challenge. It, it, uh, uh, related part of transactions is always a challenge, right? Of course, that one obvious answer would say that, well, sponsor uh, uh, should not vote on the decision of the merger, uh, and, and but that's Per, per se should not be enough because the sponsor has such a small percentage that uh, by itself it would not be able to approve the transaction. But I think that's a beginning. Not having the vote on the merger when they have also a conflicting interest, I think that's a, but I, I think that it should have an additional third party besides the pipe investors uh, helping with the valuation, either a fair opinion from a bank or something to help because uh, that's clearly a very sensitive and risky uh, approach when, when sponsors try to take one of its own companies public through a, a SPAC where it's a sponsor. Uh, but going back to your question, Rodrigo, I think that uh, I think that's one of the key features when uh, you know the, the question of this conference is, is this the new IPO? Uh, it's, and I, I agree with Daniel, uh, uh, I don't think it's the new IPO, it, and I agree with him. It's an alternative to an IPO, uh, as as you said, Rodrigo. As there are direct listings, and I think that's very positive. Uh, uh, the IPO process uh, have many positive aspects, but there is a lot of critics that people are doing IPOs the way they did in seventy years ago, uh, and some there are people who criticize the role of banks, criticize allocation, and a series of other aspects. So. It's good news that now you have an alternative. And uh, this alternative just came in because the existing model was somehow not satisfying everyone. And one of the key feature I think is to give back the company the control on the valuation. You know, if I've done IPOs in the past, it's very frustrating sometimes for a company uh, just to find out on the very end, on the very last day on the pricing day, that the valuation is not satisfactory, and and they stand up with the uh, the uh, uh, you know uh, binary solution, or either call off the IPO, which is very frustrating and embarrassing to everyone, or just accept that valuation, uh, and and more. Uh, sometimes that valuation it's it's poor, with nothing to do with the company. You know, it's just some market conditions. It was some crisis. Some. If you are a Latin America country, some other country in Latin America has defaulted, and then you're a, a, a factory in Brazil, and you're, it has nothing to do with you, but your valuation is being affected. So the possibility 
uh, of being able to early on in the process uh, with the spec uh, already a listing company say, well, I want to go public with the merger with you, but let's agree on price. I think that's a super advantage of that structure. It's negotiated. Of course, that it's uh, uh, not out of the blue. You have financial advisors involving both sides, uh, discounted cash flow, different types of methodology being used. Uh, remember that some of those companies going public have already been the object of rounds of financing with venture capitalists. So it's, uh, you have a lot of reference for that prices as well. Uh, and you agreed uh, on a non-binding agreement uh, early on at in the process, then if you have a pipe between the, the, the letter of agreement, letter of intent and the merge agreement that makes it that valuation binding, there is a different group of people, different sets of eyes that will make due diligence in the company, both financial and legal, and say, well, I do agree or I do not agree. Let's renegotiate that. And then you fix the price uh, at the time that you sign the merger agreement. And that will be the valuation by which the company will exchange its shares with the SPAC. Uh, so uh, I, I am very in favor of that uh, mechanic. Thank you, Carlos. If I can say, I mean, maybe it's really that the trick, like the traditional IPO will start to see that if like SPACs, they can create value in a consistent way, in better ways. And also where, for example, sponsors, they align them, th their self with uh, with the other investors. And so, for example, the compensation scheme of the promoter became more balanced, for example. And that can even be that once then this is uh, coming, uh, the traditional IPO can even uh, be sub substituted by SPACs. So the real treat, I think, is there. And this is the reason why many people from, I think, academia also, they are fighting this phenomenon and so on, even because imagine that you are a professor teaching for 30 years, just traditional IPO, and it's coming something like that. In the end, then, uh, as all the innovations, then uh, you are outdated. And so probably I don't criticize those people. I mean, I think that they are right. I mean, in the sense that uh, in some way, you have always to defend your type of corner in some way. So uh, the only fact is that if this revolution is coming on and on and on, and the things are going to become even a little bit more reasonable for everyone. So even with, as you said, Carlos, uh, the conflicting interest of the sponsor that maybe this time are disclosed and maybe a promote that is more aligned with the investors of the private company and the public uh, SPAC uh, public investors. These are all things and features that uh, if then they show that the value is created, why we should choose a, a expensive and time consuming route of the traditional IPO. That is the big issue in my view. Can Thank I you, Daniel. Just, uh, yes. Just one additional point before, uh, I'm sorry, I was just passing to you the word. Uh, because it has to do with valuations uh, and it's another big advantage of the of the specs and and we haven't talked about it yet which is the use of projections mm -hmm. uh, use of projections have been so much uh, uh, strict in the IPO world because there's so much liability associated with that that people simply don't do it they don't want to risk run the risk of being sued afterwards if their predictions do not materialize in the SPAC world, since the, the rules are applicable when you file uh, 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 the F4 uh, during the approval process uh, are more flexible in terms of the use of, of projections, that's another reason, in my view, why it's attracting so many companies to use that route instead of the IPOs. But yeah, I don't flexibility, think it's, flexibility. Flexibility. I don't yeah. think it's coincidence that if you look by sector, the great majority of companies have, that have chosen to go public through IPOs are technology companies. And, and why is that? Because for technology companies that usually uh, uh, have in future projections of growth, the great source of value, you don't look at uh, historical financials to value a technology company. You look at their projections. But for a technology company to do a traditional IPO without being, being able to use projection, 
you're leaving a lot of money in the table. Uh, you're being valued much below that what you can be valued because you can be talking about growth of three, four times in the coming years, and you can't talk about that, right? Carlos, the, 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 Carlo, the problem with that is I would say uh, people who are slightly more skeptic will say, yeah, with valuations, you can, with projections, you can uh, paint the sky blue every day. You, you can't, well, of course, there's, there's a limit for projections and there are cryptics, right? The, the pipe investors are there to criticize. Yeah, the yeah, yeah, the, the, the sound check. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, but uh, uh, being able to use uh, and, and, and being able to demonstrate the true perspective of growth of a company with all the risk associated with projections, people need to know that projections are simply that, projections, not uh, uh, assurance of results. Yeah. Yeah. But I think that's a big thing for technology companies. Thank you very much, Carlos. Uh, we are running out of time. Technically, we have already run out of time. But uh, I think that uh, I need to close with the last question, which I will start with Milos to give him uh, the floor. And also because I've been posing the financial question to Carlos. Now I'm going to ask Milos what he thinks about the current level of regulation. Milos, well, I would like to know uh, what is your perception coming from, from the financial side as to the current level of regulation in the market. Are we under-regulating? Are we over-regulating? Or is just the right amount of regulation? Uh, as this is my last word, I want to thank you again for this uh, <laughs> conference. And then um, I would say the current level is just good enough. I would not want uh, this uncertainty that SEC is created in April to continue. And uh, most likely they won't get uh, anything uh, like any significant rule that they would change the market. But I, I think they're going to be drawing this uh, uncertainty for quite a while because there were like some changes in the uh, crucial people who would be uh, responsible for the spot market. Uh, uh, this new person who uh, arrived uh, probably to take uh, some time to familiarize with, with uh, herself and uh, 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 on, on how the market is working. I would just uh, uh, be happy if they enable uh, uh, filing of these forms that uh, of the SPACs that uh, pre-IPO in the pre-IPO phase and in the pre-merger phase to uh, go as uh, quick as they were in the past. And uh, ideally they should uh, um, stay away. They should be like a referee. We watched all World Cup, unfortunate for England, but I guess Italians are happy. But I guess the, uh, the Security and Exchange Commission should be a referee that is not uh, obstructing the game, just like uh, trying to bring the game to the end and uh, so that everyone enjoyed. So uh, the current level of regulation in the United States is just enough. Uh, I would say, say this, and based on my some personal experience dealing with Italy and maybe dealing with uh, uh, observing some other markets in Europe, Europe is uh, far back from um, the United States. So uh, I hope that uh, the rest of um, the world catch up with the United States and hope that the United States does not do something that uh, to destroy the market. Hopefully I was uh, clear. Thank you very much, Milos. Uh, Carlos, Daniele, you have a one minute max. Who would like to go first? Uh, I, I can be very quick. Uh, I agree with Milos. I think regulation in the West right now, it's good. I think Europe still has to do some work in terms of making it more flexible and more attractive to SPACs. I think the UK is working on that. I think Amsterdam is working on that. Uh, and the focus should be, I think, both in the efforts in Europe and in the US, if you want to improve regulation, focus on disclosure uh, and make it clear for investors, not trying to restrict or limit or, or keep it for a small club. Uh, but uh, to be honest, I'm a bit worried. I know regulators tend to suffer a lot of pressure from the public, from politics. And, and I think there is a lot of, as we pointed out at the beginning, negative uh, uh, repercussion. And I'm afraid that uh, regulators may react uh, to the 
public claim and, and, and try to, to be and lose their hand. That's my great concern at this point. Thank you, Carlos. Uh, Daniele. Yes, I think, I mean, I agree also with the guest speakers that uh, regulation should not be really the final answer in SPACs because as we said, they are alternative investment vehicles, dynamic investment vehicles. So how you can regulate something that is continuously evolving, like Bitcoin, like FinTech. And it is something that uh, can only and will always pose challenging because even Ackman recently has issued a new idea of the special purpose acquisition rights company that is not a SPAC, but it's a new animal. So the, my point is this, yes, we are welcome for regulators to come up with new ideas, but even operators will come up with other uh, brilliant, very good ideas and uh, regulation can be always escaped in some way, but not in a bad way. I mean, not in something that we want to escape rules. No, no, Daniela, that. we understand that. It's that the market is dynamic. And basically, that, that's why basically regulation has evolved to principle-based regulation to be able to, to adapt to okay. uh, changes in the market. But uh, again, I think that basically uh, just to... To wrap up, sorry, Daniel, I, I, I cut across what you were saying, but basically, I don't know if you need to add anything else, or if not, I, I think that basically we have already exceeded five minutes, so then I will I will wrap it up. So I would like to just uh, join uh, all three speakers uh, uh, in thanking them for the presentations. I cannot agree more with you that uh, I think that basically we are all four of us are uh, in alignment that uh, we are creating a non-existing myth that basically what we have is nothing new under the sun. The risk is limited and the risk is all known, is completely known to all of us, which is the risk uh, inherent to the capital markets. Uh, so there's no need for this kind of buzz or bad, bad publicity about SPACs. And then on the issue of regulation is that we know that each of the underlying components of the SPAC are already regulated. So uh, there's, we are not sure whether there's a special need for specific regulation. This might lead to over-regulation and this might kill a flourishing market for a, a specific segment, which is not necessarily in competition with IPOs, but complementing uh, IPOs and direct listings. And I think that that with that, I would like to jo to invite everyone in uh, joining me in thanking the speakers. I would also like to thank very much all participants for their questions and their active participation in the chat. And also uh, a big thank you to uh, the sponsor. Uh, Ellen of Grossman Scholl LLP and see you everyone again uh, tomorrow. Thank you very much and tomorrow we are meeting again uh, on the same platform at the same time. Wherever you are, I, I was about to say 1 p.m. British summertime, but wherever you are, the time will be different. So see you all tomorrow at the same time that you join today. Thank you very much. <laughs>